Hi, hello and welcome. Um, this, there will be a second intro right after this one. Um, I record this a few days later. The reason why I upload this video already on Friday and not as I will say in a few moments after this clip um, on Sunday is that my girlfriend writes an exam um, on Friday and I upload this video the same time I think her exam will start in the morning. Um, I upload this video at 3 o'clock in the night and 6 hours later on the Philippines it will be 9 o'clock in the morning. So I hope um, this is now directly for you, my love. I hope that um, you will write the exam as perfect as possible. You are wonderful and you are the best. I know this. I love you more than anything else in the world. And um, I look forward to meet you one day in person. To um, hold you in my arms. To kiss you. Um, I love you and um, I will always love you now and forever so um, this video is dedicated to you my angel so good luck with the exam sweetie hi hello and welcome to geography now um, uh, United Kingdom my reaction as a German, my dear British friends, um, I have a lot of things to say um, about uh, in this video um, about your country and about um, probably many things you will mention. But at first, you see the blue, uh, there's a blue light in, my ba in here. Um, there, also, blue light. And then there's also, take a look, red light. So when the red, the red light is active, you don't see the blue so much, but I have both lights um, in honor for your flag. So, because your flag is blue and red, um, and also white, but I mean there's white light inside of the red and the blue light, I think. So that's alright. I hope um, you like this, uh, my reaction. Here I also have the links. Subscribe for the links. Please. I'm not sure if there are links on your island, but I guess maybe there are in other European countries. So, and I have um, a European Union flag. So, um, I bought this flag actually on in a time when Brexit was not yet completely done. And um, yeah, in my heart, you are still a part of Europe. Um, some of you will like this, some maybe not, but um, United Kingdom is for me a part of um, Europe. And um, I am very much in favor of some um, changes in Euro European Union. Mm, but maybe more about this later when I make a video about the European Union. Now it's about the United Kingdom. And. I will upload this video, then the direction, I mean the real, original video came out today. It's just 7 hours old, so I will upload this video in the next weekend or so, in a few days. But I make the reaction already now, 7 hours after it was published. Um, yes. Please subscribe. Please subscribe and, um, uh, and like this video. Mm. Subscribe for my channel, a German who speaks English. Maybe I will later also put some texts in the video and pause and just um you have to pause and read something if I have to explain myself or explain something I meant um while editing and I see what I'm talking uh, um it's not it's not it, it's not stupid but maybe um sometimes um I have the feeling that I can't um explain everything I want to say in um, words then I will write it down. Um, English is not my uh, first language, of course, it's German, but I make English, um, I make my content in English so I can reach more people in the world. So people from Canada, Argentina, China, um, Korea, um, Russia, Africa, Africa is not a country, but um, Angola, Mozambique, um, Benin, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Um, I know all of the countries in the world. Anyway, enough talk on the beginning of the video. 
I hope you will enjoy it. Um, and yeah, let's just start with the video. The video is um, 15 minutes long, so I will t probably talk in between more than enough. One, two, three. Hey, Junker Peeps. As you know, I'm American, and I just got my uh, Anglophone family reunion invite, so I guess I have to show up to be polite and all. Whoa! Yeah, he also uh, visited the United Kingdom. I saw some post um, from him on YouTube. Let's see. I also, I, of course, I want to also visit the United Kingdom myself as well. It is pretty easy, I think, for me to, I mean, kind of, it's not any longer more the European Union, but still it should be more or less easy for a tourist. And um, they speak, the, I mean, I speak English, so it's not a problem for the English. Um, so, yeah, I would love to, and I will probably also do it at some point. <sighs> Hi, Dad. Ah, uh, yeah, Dad, is because uh, um, independence they got from the United Kingdom, <laughs> the United States, so kind of it's a, yeah, in this way. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barb's Get Your Geography Now merch like this Geography Now t-shirt at geographynow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. Well, here I am in the big crumpet, the big uck, the land of kings, queens, and in-betweens. At one point, a quarter of the world's population and land area was under the... Yeah, it, it was, I think, the largest um, um, empire ever existing on um, the Earth. I mean, along with Australia and Canada and India, it's pretty much very large, and then also this chunks of Africa. Their rule. Of course, such a story came with lots of complicated chapters, and when it comes to complication, usually it's best to have a person from the country come along and help out. And for this episode, I could not think of anyone better to speak on behalf of the UK than my go-to Brit. Many of you already know him. Come on in, ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Mr. J. Foreman. Hi, hello, hello. Thank you so yes. much. I've always wanted to be on Geography Now. We, uh, tell them how we met. I think I started watching Geography Now back in the Belgium days. You accidentally stole a map from an episode of Map Man, and now we're the best of YouTube Yeah, friends. yeah, I stole your map. But I've, I've, I've probably stolen more from elsewhere. By the way, Jay, a lot has probably happened over the years. What have you been up to? Uh, this? Oh, yeah. You, oh, you made something. Yeah, I yeah. made one of these. Ah, yeah, okay. he's really good. Yeah, so, uh... <laughs> I made something. I mean, it's right. So, uh, yeah, it just, it sounds funny. Um, I think also I should make it in full screen. So, United Kingdom, def I mean, other countries deserve it as well, but, um, I sometimes do it, sometimes not. It's it's random. Um, yeah, let's continue. Maybe also my webcam will then just disappear now. I'm not sure how I will do it when I edit the video. Uh, let's talk about your country now. Shout did it. We. That is how we talk. By the way, by the way, this is my authentic uh, first reaction to this video. I have literally read for the last seven hours to do this. I even thought about doing it tomorrow or so, but I thought now I do it now. I upload it later in a week or so, or the weekend, it's just five days or so. But I record already now. Hmm. Let's continue. I'm also curious for some other um, um, reaction channels um, doing reaction to this um, country. But let's see. Look. <laughs> So, the UK today is very different from what it used to be. And no, we're not referencing how the island used to be connected to the rest of continental Europe via Doggerland. And no, we're not referencing the Mesolithic... Doggerland, yes, I've heard of this. Um, it is not so deep, the water, so it is just 30 meters or so deep, and um, if the sea level would just um, decrease by 30 meters or so, there would be a land connection between um, Europe and the United Kingdom, which is interesting. Ehrensburgian hunter-gatherers or the Neolithic agriculturalist and enormous stone transporting and solstice measuring peoples? No, we're referencing a time later on when the entire island was just a mess of clans, chiefdoms, opposing monarchs and outside monarchs trying to come in and out-monarch the said monarchs. It wasn't until much later that the country actually completed unifying everything on the island of Great Britain plus Northern Ireland, don't forget Northern Ireland, and all the overseas territories, don't forget the overseas territories, and crown dependencies. You could probably forget the crown dependencies. Yeah, because there's like a whole other thing going on. Yeah, well. Oh yeah, and you guys have a town called T. Oh, yeah. there's I a place there. near here called Trotter's Bottom. I went to Bitfield. Oh, and of course you can. 
Titty ho. Okay. Yeah. There's I a went, place yeah. near here called Trotter's Bottom. I went to Bitchfield. I mean, Sussex, uh, Sussex, and so also have this, you know, sex word inside. Um, so, nice, I mean, just because the, something is in the name is, I mean, it's Bitchfield. Bitchfield? I would, I'm, I mean, there are probably much, um, at many places, certain words inside of, um, city names or um, county names or some sort of provinces names which sound funny in certain languages or in their own language um, have, have some funny meaning Bitfield. Oh and of course you can't forget Stand by and put the to get a clean drop of Santa City go 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 Very good, very good, very good, excellent, cheers Stand by I have, uh, I, I heard, I've heard of this place but um. I mean, it's it's nice that they um, separated up there in different um, parts and not sure a single word like here. I, I don't know if I would, would be able to pronounce it. Very good, very good, very good, excellent. Cheers. Actually, speaking of places in Britain, um, did you know that we've got some of the weirdest and hardest to pronounce places in the world? Okay. Leicester, Fromey, Ruislip, Ch 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 Chiswick, Landfall. Stanesley. <laughs> <laughs> Slanesli! Slanesli! Oh yeah, that's Welsh, isn't it? It is Welsh. Oh, so those Welsh you Those can Welshies, you can't trust them. Well, in any case, let's look at the map, shall we? First of all, the main chunk of what makes up the UK is Great Britain, located off the northwest. Uh, yeah, the difference between Great Britain, the British Isles, it's the United Kingdom, and um, yeah, Great Britain. Great Britain is just, I think, the big island. Um, the United Kingdom is a big island with um, Northern Ireland, the British Isles are um, United Kingdom and Ireland, and Ireland is Ireland, and um, the Republic of Ireland is just Ireland, also northern part of Ireland. Um, also, the Republic of Ireland has also, I think, a point more north to the northern part of Ireland, which belongs to the United Kingdom. I don't know, but I'm not mistaken. Western coast of the continental mainland of Europe, north of France, separated by the English Channel, and east of Ireland, separated by the Irish Sea to the east, as well as the North Sea, and to the north, the North Atlantic. The island of Great Britain is made up of three constituent countries. England, which holds about 84% of the country's population. Scotland. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's mid England, Scotland, and Wales. Yeah, different, um, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's similar to Dutch or to, um, the Kingdom of Dutch, um, where Dutch is a part of, and the islands is the Caribbean. It is, I think, something um, similar. Um, a kingdom, which is split up between different um, provinces or parts. But uh, I, I, um, I certain people who say that England is a country, and Scotland is a country, and Wales is a country, um, and then it's always, always, for me, a bit weird what do these people mean when they say country. Um, when I say country, I mean independent states like, for example, Germany, or the United Kingdom, or Denmark, or Russia, or France, and not uh, this kind of country where, I mean, England is not an independent country. England is a part of the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom is a sovereign state, um, which is also a member state of the United Nations, and so, so it also always depends on what you define as a country, of course. But um, I had many arguments with um, about the topic, and people um, are sometimes really weird when they. Um, uh, I mean, it, it of course we, when we, this argument is just about the d different definitions of what is in the country. But yeah, anyway, a country in my in this way I mean, or always when I talk about countries, is a sovereign state, which with um, for example also a UN. UN member state. So, and not England is not a UN member state, and Scotland is also not a UN member state, but the United Kingdom is a United States, United Nations member state. Anyway, you can also argue about this in the comments if you want. It, I think it's just a question of your definition of a country, but let's continue. 
which holds about 8%, and Wales at about 1.5%. From there, they also administer Northern Ireland, which doesn't exactly have an official political title. Some say it's a constituent country, some say it's a region or province, but to this day, it lies across the Irish Sea on the northern section of the island of Ireland, making it their largest land border with any country. Outside of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, though, the UK has three crown dependencies and 14 overseas territories. Um, crown dependencies, I think, are the Isle of Man, Jersey, and... Um, there are two islands in here. I think it's those two islands um, of the coast of France, Jersey and um, the other one I forgot. But those three are the, are the crown dependencies. The 14 overseas territories I don't know by heart. 12 of which are small islands in the Caribbean, Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans, and two of them, Gibraltar and the sovereign bases of Akrotiri and Dekelia, are small areas attached to the larger shared land masses of Spain and Cyprus. Keep in mind the crown dependencies of the Isle of Man, Guernsey, and Jersey are technically not considered part of the UK. Um, Jersey and Jersey, okay, that's both a different name. Um, interesting but are still subject to the UK's defense and international representation. And finally, the British Antarctic Territory and its main base at Rothera is a section of Antarctica that does not have any actual sovereign status, as all countries are subject to the Antarctic Treaty, which states no one can colonize the continent. The entire domain that falls under the UK's sovereignty spans across nine time zones. Anyway, back to the main island. This is where things take a twist. First off, keep in mind, each of the constituent countries of Scotland and Wales, as well as whatever you want to label Northern Ireland, has their own parliament system with a head called a First Minister. Whereas England does not have its own separate parliament, as they just use the same country capital's Westminster Palace building as the meeting place for all English elected constituent officials, since it's pretty much always been the spot used for them anyway, and they see no need to complicate things further. On paper, England has 48 counties, Scotland has 32 council areas, Wales has 22 principal areas, and Northern Ireland has 6 counties. However, keep in mind that many of these are disputed, people don't pay attention to them, and many might just refer to their traditional areas, which is another topic. In any case, the capital and largest city and largest city in Western Europe is London. After that, it's Manchester at number two and Birmingham at number three. Also, keep in mind the City of London, or the City of London Corporation, has its own separate government, which is independent from the rest of the country. This means that the Lord Mayor of London is technically the highest ranking official in the UK after the monarch, even though the City of London in itself is just one small part of Greater London. London alone has four of the top ten busiest airports in the country, Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, and Luton, whereas outside of the London area, Manchester International comes in at number three and Edinburgh International at number 6. Just on the east side of England lies the port of Felixstowe, the largest and busiest shipping port. Many of the cities I have never heard of, like Felixstown, I heard of Manchester, I heard of Birmingham, um, of course London and Edinburgh, but um, for example Felixstown I have not heard of um, last name. Of the country. The country has a very extensive road and rail network, and otherwise, London's Waterloo and Victoria are the largest train stations, and the completion of the Channel in 1994 officially connected the UK to the rest of mainland Europe via France. Except literally no one calls it the Channel. Um, I have heard, I have um, seen pictures from where the first um, tunnel worker from Great Britain and France meet in um, underground and they exchange some flags, and it was a very nice picture, and um, I would also love to travel to the um, tunnel at some point seems um, like an awesome thing to do interesting um, especially I mean it, it's probably not that difficult to do but you know they're um, changing the side from um, driving on the left side on the UK and driving on the right side in France this also seems quite fun channel ever I call it the channel. No, you don't. It's the Channel Tunnel, or the Eurostar, or Le Shuttle, or anything but channel. No one says channel. Calling it channel. <laughs> so as you can see, when it comes to the administrative divisions, the UK is quite possibly the biggest nightmare in the world. And keep in mind, we didn't even mention all the other confusing administrative levels like combined authority areas, metropolitan counties, lieutenancy areas, or lieutenancy areas, depending how you want to pronounce it, parishes, wards. It's a lot. Yeah. To help a little bit more on understanding on how all these things actively work, we could mention the 650 constituency system in which 650 small sections of the country get represented in the parliament and um, this seems quite um, fun to learn them by heart if they are really 600 and so but there's something we really have to mention when i see this parliament on the left side and um, there was once a speaker you know um i don't know how, how his name was but he was famous for his order order and it, <laughs> i love this video he's amazing this is how you should um deal with um a parliament and I um, mean it, it's it's also the British Parliament is I think much more 
um, I mean, it, it's much more about um, really arguing than, for example, um, in German, I think, where the most um, laws are decided with a big majority of the governing parties. Um, and in from what I have seen, maybe it is similar there, but from what I have seen, it looks much more. Um, it looks much more like there are really debates happening. Um, and that's amazing. I like it. And yeah. I really, really like this um, um, former, um, how is his name, um, speaker, speaker of the house. Yeah, let, let's continue. With a representative is so complicated. The way we do things in this country is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it is massively broke, still don't fix it. Anyway, off of that note, uh, the UK has a bicameral legislature consisting of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So the House of Commons is the one that you see on the telly, and the House of Lords is the big room next door where they wear robes and this weird. And the wigs too, right? Wigs sometimes, and yeah. There this seems quite um, funny. Um, I, I've heard of this also before from of the with the um royal and um, people which are sirs and ladies meet and it's quite interesting to have something like this i don't know if it is modern or if it fi i mean so also the monarchy um i think it holds the country kind of together so it is not anything um, i mean it, it's okay no no complaints um I mean, who am i to complain <laughs> It, it it seems maybe a bit weird for some pe countries and people, but uh, yeah, I have no problem with I have no problems with this, but yeah, that's that's interesting. They're appointed, okay. so there are four ways you can get into the House of Lords. Uh, one of them is by giving lots of money to the governing party, and then they sort of as a favor make you a lord. But that's not officially how it works, so don't. I, I, that's not what I said. The other way is if you're an expert in something like uh, the law or the arts or beer. The other way is if you happen to be born with a dad who's already a um, hereditary peer. So it can be hereditary. It can be hereditary, mm -hmm. and you're allowed to become a member of the House of Lords as long as you don't have any older brothers. Isn't it insane? Some British place names just from looking at the name you can tell which part of the country it's in so for example if it's got a celtic name which means it has words like tre loch brin and abba that means you're likely to find it in wales or if it's got a viking suffix such as thwaite thorpe kirk or b that means you're likely to find it in the north and then there are the anglo-saxon place names such as ing ham berry ford port and so on and so on so you can actually tell which group of people influence which area based off of the suffix of the name of the place sort of although that was probably more true hundreds of years moment I'm back. I just um, did some. I'm back, and we continue with the video. Ago and now these days, all the names get mixed up, and they come up with new place names all the time. God, gotta have that Trotter's bottom. So all of that brings us to the obvious topic: the UK is a constitutional monarchy. Technically, the king is in charge, and it's his country and it's his laws. But how this practically works is he's just a ceremonial figurehead, and it's actually the government and the prime minister that make all the actual decisions. But he could also step in if he wanted to. Yeah. In theory, he yeah. could, could step in and say, "I don't like this law," but he knows full well that if he tried that, there'd be an instant revolution and we'd set Buckingham Palace on fire. You got another. Oliver Cromwell situation. Jay did a lot of videos on this type of stuff. We'll just put oh, an yeah, annotation. So just check out his videos. Long story short, it wasn't always this way. In fact, the UK's history. And um, maybe I will also um, watch some of his videos. Um, I mean, maybe I will make a reaction. I'm not sure um, how his videos are made and if they, I want to make a reaction and if I can make a reaction. This is always also a topic. Um, um, with new channels, um, Jacob, you know, has no problems with reactions. I think I never got any problems from any video I up uploaded. Mm. But and I also support him on Patreon, by the way. And yeah, but let's see. Is more like the combined histories of the three constituent countries of Scotland, England, and Wales, plus a little bit of Northern Ireland, but that's a whole other thing. The, yeah, that's the, the thing. Like, even, yeah. even though the UK is a country, like the bits that make it up are also called countries. Yeah, there's no simple way to condense this whole history. Maybe they will talk about the different um, definition of countries. I'm not sure. Let's see. 
history. Let's try anyway. Ancient Beaker culture. Celts arrived and split into the Britons, Gaels and Picts. Romans fail to conquer the Picts. They build Hadrian's Wall. Romans lead. In come the Germanic tribes. Scotland splits into four kingdoms. Egbert becomes the first Saxon king. And then the Anglo-Saxons split into seven kingdoms. Anglo-Saxon, by the way, is where the name England comes from. Ah. Uh... Uh... Cornwall falls to Wessex, but keeps its language and culture. Meanwhile, Wales was made up of many kingdoms, but the largest are Gwynedd, Powys, and Diffid. Vikings come in, raid much of the Hebrides, Island, and Isle of Man. Scots and Picts join to create the kingdom of Alba. Danish Vikings come in and create the Danelaw. This is also how lots of Danish words crept their way back into modern English, such as leg, window, and yes, even ra um, I think also Dan Danish and um, Norwegian and Sweden. I said it in the Sweden episode as well. <coughs> are all Germanic um, based languages. Or from the. Um, maybe they have a ba um, common base language, I'm not sure. But they have, um, the, it's a Germanic language family, I think. Um, just like Germany also. German is also a language from this um, fam language family, as far as I understand. And also, when I I learned I learned a bit Dutch recently, um, uh, and many many things. The structure of the sentences, um, from German to Dutch is very similar, and I think things are also many similarities between um, German and English and Dutch and English and so on. Maybe I make a video about this someday, or I find a good video I can react to. Let's see. By the way, please hit the red button and subscribe to my channel if you have not done that already. Maybe there will be now a cool animation now where a button appears on the left and um, top right corner, and you can click it and also click the bell to be notified about the videos I make in the future. If you are interested, so of course only. Exactly what the Danes were doing. Anglo-Saxon Ethelson fights against them and becomes the first king of England. Meanwhile, in the 11th century, Griffith ap Llewellyn becomes the only king that ruled over all of Wales, but then it is quickly killed by one of his own people. William of Normandy takes over England and thus begins the Norman dynasty. Angevin Empire via the House of Plantagenets begins Crusades. Oops. Richard Lionheart plays a huge role in this. King John is terrible and then his barons force him to sign the Magna Carta. 1284. Edward I conquers Wales and integrates it into England, but they maintain their language and culture. Alexander III of Scotland dies and 14 rivals claim succession to the throne. 14th century, Charles IV of France dies with no heir, so Edward III was eligible through his mum, but the French were like, hell no, and elected Prince Philip of Valois, and hence began the 100 Years War. Yes, this is when the Joan of Arc thing happened. Edward III dies, many claimants to the throne rise up, and thus begins the War of the Roses. 16th century, Tudor dynasty begins, and thus all that crazy Henry VIII stuff goes down. You know the history? Divorce. Well, um, I think uh, European history is very, very much um, based on the history of France, the United Kingdom, and maybe Germany, maybe also Russia, but um, yeah, to a certain degree, definitive. But the Western Europe, it's mostly uh, German, um, France, and the United Kingdom, I think. They are based, they influence the uh, history very, very much. And also, of course, ha or, um, Austria with, uh, um, how was this family called? Uh... There was one family which um, very much influenced m many of the monarchies in, in Europe. Wait, I forgot the name. I'm stupid. Maybe I will have my probably the a name here written somewhere, maybe. And I remember when I edited the video and know the name then. Habsburg. The Habsburg family. Yeah. The Habsburgs. They, um, I think they had many, um, family connections to many different countries and their monarchies. I heard this. Let's continue. Beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. It's cute because it rhymes. Meanwhile, in 1585, the British take their first stab at colonizing what is now Virginia in the USA, which eventually evolved into the 13 colonies. Meanwhile, the East India Company begins shortly after. Elizabeth I rule leads to the Mary Queen of Scots thing and the Spanish Armada. 17th century, Elizabeth I dies. Closest relative is James VI of Scotland, and he becomes ruler, hence joining Scotland and England for the first time, becoming the first monarch to rule over the entire island of Great Britain. Conspirators try to assassinate him and blow up Parliament, aka the Guy Fawkes thing. Charles I and Parliament have tensions and thus begins the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell becomes Lord Protector after dissolving the monarchy, but after he dies, the monarchy is restored with Charles II. Man, you guys really went back to that monarchy thing fast. <laughs> like... In the 17th century, Scotland unsuccessfully attempts colonies in Panama and Nova Scotia and it has a, an economic crisis. 1707, the union between Scotland and England is finalized. Queen Anne dies, ending the House of Stuart, and in comes the House of Hanover. Wars, wars, and more expensive wars. Great Britain taxes colonies to try and make up for the debt. Colonies aren't happy, which 
leads to the War of Independence for America. The Industrial Revolution. <laughs> let's just pass over that whole chapter. <laughs> Captain James Cook swings by Australia and New Zealand and hey, let's establish some more penal colonies. Napoleonic Wars. East India Company is met with revolt and leads to a full takeover of India in 1858. Berlin Conference split up areas that European powers would administer in Africa. World War I, 1921, land grabs from the crumbling... I see that the part after the First World War where the empire was the largest, the British Empire, so was from New Zealand, um, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, um, British India, um, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and um, Yemen, um, Iraq, um, Kuwait, uh, Jordan, Egypt, all of these African countries from S Sudan, Kenya, um, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, um, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Lesotho, um, Eswatini, South Africa, Nigeria, um, uh, Ghana, and um, Sierra Leone, G Gambia, N Guyana, Belize, uh, Jamaica, uh, Bahamas, and Canada. Cyprus. I think that's everything. I hope I did for good. No, Sri Lanka, um, Maldives, um, Pakistan, yeah, but it's all in British India. So I hope I did not forget anything. Mm, yeah, let's continue. German and Ottoman empires resulted in the height of the territorial rule for the UK. 1922, Ireland breaks away. World War II, the whole Winston Churchill and the Battle of the Blitz stuff happened. Afterwards, one by one, the former territories got their independence. The Commonwealth of Nations is established. Joins NATO. Paramilitary violence in Northern Ireland. Sorry about that. Joins the European Economic Community, which was like a predecessor to the EU. Monetarism policies are enacted under the Margaret Thatcher years. Falkland Islands War. 2008, global financial crisis followed by a Scottish referendum ending in remaining part of the UK. 20... That's also in that's interesting. Two thousand eight global. Um. So. Um. Ah, Scotland. As hard as it so Falkland Islands. I'm stupid. Um. So. But how? I'm not, I'm curious how this will maybe change over time now because um, I think that Scotland um Scots didn't like the Brexit very much. Um. Also, I have to talk about, um, I mean, uh, maybe in the history, I mean, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but um, I think also Great Britain joined uh, um, the Bush administration in the war against Iraq, which is, I think, something you have to mention as something bad the United Kingdom did. I mean, okay, I'm sure it has something you have to mention, and that um, um, Bush, is, uh, together with, um, how was the name of the Prime Minister? Um, Tony Blair belong in prison for the war crimes um, against Iraq. Financial crisis followed by a Scottish referendum ending in remaining part of the UK. 2016, the UK votes at nearly 52% to leave the EU. Uh, uh, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth the <laughs> Jay has um, also his opinion and it seems about Brexit. Uh, yeah, my European flag. For me, you are all still part of, the, of Europe. One day you can rejoin maybe um, I think it would be better for your economy and um, maybe together we can um, reform the European Union to be a more democratic um, organization for all of us, to the um, greater good of all of us. The second longest reigning British monarch passes away. Her son, King Charles III, is coronated. Crowned. So there you go, an oversimplified outline of the thousands of years of like 70, 20, 10% British, Scottish, Welsh history all jammed into a cheesy YouTube skit with minimal props and slapstick humor. The thing you'll hear most often from people who love the royal family is how good it is for tourism. Despite the fact that if we got rid of the monarchy, we could turn Buckingham Palace into a really expensive museum. Eh, but then there wouldn't be a monarch to like fantasize about the fairy tale monarch, princess, king, queen stuff. You know, it's like, but then maybe <laughs> King Charles could retrain and get a different job as a charter quantity. Yeah, but it, it takes away the whole fantasy aspect. We think of monarchs as like magical creatures. That's the problem! <laughs> Despite an increasing number of Republicans, which in this country means people vying for a republic against the idea of a monarchy, most Brits are okay with the royal family. It has a unique role as both representing longevity and tradition and tabloid fodder. I don't know, I really do think it does have a lot to do with tourism. Sure. And, th whereas, and then we come in. Yeah. Whereas when Brits go on holiday within our own country, we like. Um, I I think also it's it's more fun. I mean, we have also I think in Spain a monarchy, in um, Belgium, in Denmark, in Norway, when I'm not mistaken, uh, and don't forget any. And it's um it's quite fun. So, um as long as it's not an absolute monarchy, but a constitutional monarchy, I think it's alright, and it it helps maybe the country. 
I mean, I would not. I would also want to visit the United Kingdom without the monarchy. So, um, I just want to visit this this country and uh, see the interesting places from Stonehenge to museums to many other interesting places. And, um, yeah, here speaking uh, here, people speaking English. Maybe, um, try to uh, sound more British after a visit. Let's see. to go to the seaside places like south end the longest pleasure pier in the world and speaking of which uh we got a guy who uh kind of saved a lot of people over there and he's gonna do the famous places segment come on in mr tommy boy so other than south end pier the longest pleasure pier in the world which i did save by peeing on when it was on fire true story other places you need to visit are london obviously st paul's cathedral buckingham palace the london eye tower of london tower bridge the house of parliament big ben red telephone boxes of which many have now been repurposed police box i have I have House of Parliament, Big Ben, Red Telephone. I have seen such a you know the boxes here. of which I have seen such a thing with um, books inside. Um, I, I think also it's something similar looking. Um, I have we have also here in Germany. At least I have seen something like this before in Germany. Maybe it's not also come here, but um, to have uh, a, maybe a shelf or something like this um, outside where you can um take a book and also place books i have seen such things also before i like it many have now been repurposed police boxes for you doctor who fans stonehenge see henge which isn't even a henge silvery hill the royal ascot and its many funny hats bath with its roman baths the jurassic coast including Dirtle door the ammonites and fossil beach in lime regis windsor castle the shambles in york the peak and lake districts the eden project next we're going to do wales many castles including carnefron conway Caerphilly, cardiff snowdonia with mount snowdon which you can actually go up on a train Henry's Lake Quarry, the underground trampoline park in Clackwood, Dobby the House Elf's grave, where people keep leaving their socks. So next, we're going to go up to Scotland. Dobby the House. This is this is, <laughs> this is wonderful. It's it's funny. Yeah, I I like. I would definitely visit this. I have not heard of this. Um, it sounds interesting. I mean, it it looks interesting. Um, yeah ourselves grave where people keep leaving their socks so next we're going to go up to scotland first you have to start with edinburgh with its royal mile calton hill the castles st kilda orkney and lewis for neolithic stone circles shetland for ponies isla sky loch ness what i personally think is the coolest thing in the whole of the uk fingal's cave it's on the island of Staffa. you can walk in the cave you can walk on it on, like, on top there are puffins everywhere and when you're on the boat there are whales and dolphins swimming next to you we jump across to northern ireland which you can actually see from scotland Fun fact, and we start off with the Giant's Causeway, Caracareed Rope Bridge, the Titanic Museum, the Dark Hedges, and now for the. I have also heard of um, some people or uh, um, some people talking about um, maybe a unification of Ireland because also Northern Ireland voted, I think, largely in favor of, um, I mean, against Brexit. So, I mean, uh, who knows what the future will look like, but um, it's very interesting. Um, and I'm curious, but I would definitely want to visit all of these places, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, Wales, and of course, England. Overseas territories, the Gibraltar Rock with its Barbary Apes, Jersey, where you can see some cows, Guernsey, <laughs> <laughs> Guernsey and Alderney, some of the most fortified islands on earth, and go to the Isle of Man to see the TT motorbike races. I mean, overall, I'm so glad I got to do this trip. It was Give me so some love. Fun. Honestly, it was so man, fun. Like, that's we so much fun. <laughs> Whew, that was a lot to process and we didn't even scratch the surface or the scratchy bottom <laughs> But um, they have not mentioned the other overseas territories from the Falkland Islands to many of the Pacific Indian Ocean Islands Maybe they will do it later But alas, we must move on to the next segment of this ever complicated nation the physical geography Now when discussing the landscape of the I have already reached um, um, nearly 40 minutes um, of recording and it is just 40, mi 40 minutes of recording and it's just 14 minutes of um, the video. Okay, most people, you know, they just kind of like default in their minds to the typical hilly green pastures or the Scottish. Like the video, please like the video and subscribe to my channel.
Irish Highlands and just uh, like a lot of rain. And yes, that does apply to much of the country, but if we're going to be technical, you can also include coconut tree lined atolls, frozen glaciers, erupting volcanoes, beaches with penguins, and much more. Let's look at the map to explain, shall we? First of all, the main part of the country, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, are located in the western parts of the Eurasian Plate, with many, many fault lines feeding through, especially in the island of Great Britain. The most general way to divide the island is with the T's X line, which is an imaginary diagonal boundary that separates the lowlands with the highland regions in the north and west. This geological formation is also what contributes to some hot spring areas along the line, most notably in areas like Derbyshire and the city of Bath. The most notable fault line, though, would be the Great Glen Fault up in Scotland, which splits like a scar through the Scottish Highlands, which are the highest part of the country, and also hold the tallest peak of the country, then Nevis. This fault line also creates long, deep rift lakes like the famous Loch Ness, which is the most voluminous lake in the entire country, holding nearly double the amount of water in all the lakes of England and Wales combined. If you want to find the lake with the largest surface area, though, you'd have to go to Northern Ireland and visit Loch Ney. If you want to find the longest river, though, many people might mistakenly say it's the Thames, which, although it is an important river that goes through London, it is not the longest. The longest is is actually the Severn River that starts in the highlands of Wales and meanders through England and empties into Bristol Bay. In any case, if we want to be completely well-rounded on the sovereign domain of the UK, you could include everything from the tropical beaches of Caribbean island territories like Anguilla and Turks and Caicos. Montserrat Island actually had an enormous volcanic eruption in 1995 that destroyed the entire southern part of the island, including the former capital Plymouth. The South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands are the coldest parts of the UK's territories with permanent glaciers and protected wildlife breeding grounds. The South Sandwich Islands are pretty volcanically active too, especially Mount Belinda, Mount Curry, and Mount Michael, which create an eerie sight of for, of some of those places I've never heard before. This Sandwich Islands, nice name, but <laughs> I mean maybe I've heard of it at some point, but uh, it, there's no nothing I really am um, connect with. Fire and ice when they erupt. In any case, these are all just examples that show the range of what you can naturally find in areas that fall within the sovereignty of the UK. Now, despite being a nation smaller in area than the country of Guinea in West Africa, the UK today stands with the sixth largest national economy by nominal GDP in the world. We used to be number five. Many factors attributed to this prosperity growth. Um, I think it is the uh, United States, of course, then um, China. Or I think China will overtake um, the United States in the coming decades. I think that it's Japan, then it's Germany, and maybe France, then fifth and sixth is the UK. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just sure about the first four with um, US, China, Japan, and Germany. Such as the Industrial Revolution, or the fact that we were an island isolated, but not too isolated from continental Europe, with access to multiple naval trade routes that we dominated and protected. Now, this is where I usually take my triple shot espresso break and Noel fills in for the rest of the segment. However, since I'm here in the UK, I guess I'll have to switch things up and do an English breakfast tea break. Coming right up. Here you go, take this. Oh wow, this is a thing that you guys do. <laughs> Sugar? Uh, you're getting that, to that much. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not bad. It's good. But like, is there any way to make it stronger? It's as strong as it needs to be. Oh, he's f***ing drinking it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I try some? <laughs> I don't hate it as much I as I should. You, you don't it hate it as much as... Yes! <laughs> America! <laughs> um, I would not put any milk in my tea. I mean, I also never have to drink black tea, so I, I would also not drink black tea. I just drink normal fruit tea, um, so I can't say um, about black tea, but I don't think I would like it. It's too bitter, it's maybe similar to coffee. I don't like coffee. The UK, join forces! <laughs> All right, the UK, let's get to it, okay? So historically, many of the parts that made up the UK followed some brutal and ineffective economic practices. For example, people were expected to stay and work in their home parishes, even if there was no work. Those that wandered off to find work elsewhere were deemed vagabonds, and if caught, were subject to things like whippings or being put into stocks. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. Eventually though, over time, many parts of what are now England fell into a system of mercantilism, or a policy that attempted to maximize tariff exports with quotas while minimizing Imports. That kind of worked, but as you know, most of the world hates tariffs, so eventually they had to drop that system in 1840. The Industrial Revolution was without a doubt a game changer that launched the UK into global dominance. Things like the sewing machine, steam powered engines, and turbines, the telegraphs revolutionized the entire. Um, I have I have to say something about a movie I watched and I really like. It's called The Northern's House. It takes place in the Industrial Revolution time. And it's a wonderful um, love story, and also a story about other things, but 
I, for me, it for me always the love part or the romantic part was the most important one, but also it tells about it tells um about the situation of the working class in in this time and about other things and it's it's amazing. I like it very much. This this this, this look say I mean the looks I mean how he is always take looking at her and she looks at him. It's amazing. It's it's super romantic and I like it very much. I will have a name probably in the, on the screen or in the description about um the the, the what I mean the movie because I think different um movies about Nelson about this book Nelson's House from I'm not even sure how the name of the author is I will have it on the, in the on the screen I think I cannot think about the name but the the movie is wonderful and um Elizabeth Glaskell. Elizabeth Gaskell um is the name of the who um of the author who wrote the book Nelson's House I think and um I will also have the name and maybe even the director of the movie on screen of the of the movie about Nelson's House I mean so I think it was a series on television or TV in six parts but. Um, anyway, um, I have right now also reached the total length of the um, reaction. So anything um, plus half an hour, so the, the my reaction will definitely be, even if I would not say anything from now on, above one hour long, and I will continue to say certain things, so it will be maybe one and a half hour, maybe two hours long, I'm not sure. But I hope you liked, uh, like it and... Um, Subscribe to it, to my channel, or to, to joke with you know, of course. ...manufacturing system, where now things were made by machine instead of by hand. Every region had their distinct industry and resources. Newcastle focused on shipbuilding, from Manchester, cotton, Middlesbrough, iron and steel, Scotland, wool, and linen. Telegraphs can now send messages from the UK to India. And Manchester, Manchester is also one of the cities um, I've heard um, from, um, also in school, about the Industrial Revolution, also... Um, Please, um, also, if I say anything which is um, wrong, correct me in the comments. Um, if you have a different opinion, also write, down, write it down in the comments. Um, there are certain things where I have a strong opinion, uh, too. Um, Brexit is not one of them things. But, for example, the Iraq war and so. So, um, if you have to say, if you want to say anything about certain topics I mentioned and have a different opinion, please tell me in the comments. I don't claim to know everything. But what I know is sometimes very um, disgusting, like for example in Iraq and uh, the United States is I think the main component in this um, war against Iraq but great and the United Kingdom supported this um, uh, and for example Germany did not so um, but also there if you know something I don't know write it down in the comments tell me what your opinion is and also about Brexit and for example also Julian uh, Julian Assange. I recently uh, watched from Democracy Now a video a funny name um, similar name to Geography Now. I think except the uh, um, similar name there's nothing in common. But Democracy Now uploaded a video um, from something which happened in the beginning of this year, a conference I think in um, Washington D.C. When I'm not mistaken. From different people, also, um, how was how is his name? Um, uh, um, Jeremy Corbyn was also the Labour Party chief, the former leader of the Labour Party. Um, was also in in the United States in in this conference. And he also spoke out and um, spoke f um, in favor of um, dropping the charges against um, Julian Assange, who was, I think, in prison in Plench. Um, I don't know, who, how was the name of the prison? Um, something with B, but I forgot. Um, Lynchmark? Lynchmark? Something like this. But um, maybe I'm wrong, and, um, but he spoke out um, in favor of... Um, Dropping the charges against Julian Assange, which I support, of course. A free Julian Assange. 
he's a hero for speaking out against powerful governments. Um, but yeah, that's um, I have now it's no longer fifty one minutes. Anyway, <laughs> this will be a long video. If you watch through the entire video for me, then you are amazing. Um, my reactions are often very long, much longer than um, the videos themselves. I also often and also I mean. I always pause when saying something. I think it's very, very awesome to pause. I don't like it if people who react to videos um, just speak into the video. Just pause, say what you have to say, and unpause again. It makes it too much more comfortable to watch. Anyway, I love reactions, so, <laughs> but I don't like it when people speak into the um, original video hours and you could arrive to a destination in a few hours via train instead of days by horse and carriage. With this new advancement and advantage, the UK changed their strategy of becoming a hegemonic naval powerhouse while subsidizing and delegating specific regions for private trading companies to monopolize off of. For example, the Muscovy Company was in charge of trading with Russia, the East India Company took over the Indian Ocean, and the Hudson Bay Company was in charge of Canada. Moscow Company region for private trading companies to monopolize off of. For example, the Muscovy company was in Muscovy, Muscovy um, company in charge of trading with Russia. The East India company took over the Indian Ocean and the Hudson Bay. I've never heard of the Muscovy company. Um, I don't know how much they um, exploited um, the region. I, I think they did, but I've heard of East India, East India company um, exploiting um, India at um, Hudson Bay Company, I've also not heard of, but maybe I've heard of it a bit, but the M Muscovy Company, I've never heard of, I think. The company was in charge of Canada. Granted, much of their economic activity was also riddled with labor from enslaved African peoples, even though it was never recognized in British law. Most of the about two and a half million people were transported to the Caribbean, the second most popular destination after Brazil, to work on mostly sugar plantations between the 17th and 19th centuries. Eventually, slavery was abolished in 1807 with the slave... Um, 1807, uh, but it was never in law, um, in the, in Great Britain, or oh, wasn't, was it in law? I think he mentioned that it was not in law, the so slave, slavery. Trade Act. However, in practice, it still went on for over two more decades until the Slave Abolition Act was passed in 1833. Of course, this was a dark moment of history for the UK. Eventually, those sugar plantation islands would gain independence and form new nations like Jamaica, Barbados, and most of the Lesser Antilles Islands. Overall, you can see how the story of industrialization mixed with naval trade were key factors. And speaking of naval activity, you can occasionally find things like gray seals and basking sharks in the waters around the UK. And to talk more about the wildlife, here's Gary. Arlo, you look a lot like Caleb. I'm back! You can't get rid of me and my amazingly accurate Aussie accent. So first, let's focus on Great Britain. Today there are 14 national parks, 9 in England, 3 in Wales, and 2 in Scotland. There aren't many large mammals found on the island. Today, the largest native mammal is the red deer. Most of the predators like wolves and bears were hunted to extinction centuries ago. Those bearskin caps worn by the Queen's Guard were actually made from Canadian black bear pelts. As a temperate climate zone, reptiles are not very common. Only three native species of lizard exist, and all snakes except the European adder are non-venomous. The national animals of the UK all make no sense. Um, I think the national um, animal of the United Kingdom is the lion. I have heard of this in a different video I watched today, which does not make much sense because there was never a lion, I think, in the on the islands but anyway for England it's the lion which is not even native to the European continent let alone the UK whereas for Scotland it's the unicorn and Wales is the Welsh dragon which haven't been discovered yet but I'm <laughs> maybe they will discover the Welsh dragon at some point it's unicorn as well I like this Good. I mean, also the red flag is one of the most beautiful flags, I think. Um, maybe not the most beautiful, there are many nice flags, for example, in the Caribbean, but a very nice kind of flag. 
Morning. Most people will say that the English Bulldog is a very iconic animal that epitomizes the British spirit. Otherwise, if we are discussing the... That's, that's maybe something which is really um, true. I think also Churchill was um, called the Bulldog or so, um, as a joke or so, I'm not sure. What, but I think he was called this from some people and... Yeah. Um... Maybe this fits to the spirit of being British. Overseas territories abroad, the wildlife spectrum expands to a wide range that includes things like flamingos and iguanas in Turks and Caicos, to elephant seals and macaroni penguins of the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands, as they are very popular breeding ground for various species. I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess I guess I'll go uh, back into the blackness now. I um, but something I want to ask you guys, British people. Um, I mean, uh, are there really bigger cities um, outside of the British Isles, um, on the overseas territories, and maybe the Falkland Islands? I mean, it's a bigger landmass, I think, um, than most of the other um, islands. But I'm not sure. Um, so, are there any bigger cities out there? If yes, please mention them or tell me about them, if you like, if you would um, like to do so. Fade out. Yeah. Obscurity is where I go. Where will we go next? Thank you, Gary. Definitely not Caleb Harlow. Well, as you can see, the ocean has played a huge role in the UK story, whether it be the naval trading routes or the fishing industry. To talk more about the food of the UK, here's one of our British jogger peeps, Rob. Hey, what's going on, guys? So it's my section now. I like this very much when they bring people from the country um, into this episode. Noah, I'm coming for you. The Britain tends to have a reputation, particularly among the rest of Europe, for having mm, food. I have to say something. Um, I used to eat um at some point in my past um English breakfast, which um consists out of at least in my case consists out of sausages, ketchup, and bread. I mean, there are also other people also eat um bacon and eggs and so, but. For me, it was just sausages and bread, I think, and ketchup. But I like it. I liked it. Dull, bland, flavorless food. But you know what? Uh, beans, yeah. Ba um, bacon and beans. I would say that's not the case. No, it's just we enjoy more cozy food and we do have flavor. For one, the most popular dish in Britain by some distance is a curry. Most notably is the chicken tikka masala, which wasn't even invented in India, claimed to be invented by a Pakistani in Glasgow. The dish we're most particularly proud of has to be the full English. You know, your breakfast, the eggs, your bean, bacon, sausage, black pudding, sheared tomatoes and mushrooms. Otherwise, some of the top dishes you might encounter on a visit to the UK are things like Yorkshire pudding, bangers and mash, marmite, but if you do put it on toast you've got to put it lightly, you can't overdo it, Lancashire hot pot, toad in the hole, Welsh rarebit, Cornish pasties. Um, I'm also interested if he will make a video about his trip, maybe he already made a video about his trip and just haven't watched it, um, and I look forward to the British um, fan fly Friday flag um, analyze a video. Scotch egg, beef wellington, shepherd's pie, steak and kidney pie, pie and mash with jelly deals, which is an East London cockney delicacy. We love our meat pies. And of course, you cannot visit the UK without having our most famous dish, fish and chip. Whitby is known for having some of the best fish and chips in the country. For dessert, you might want to try something like an Eaton mess, Bakewell tart, sticky toffee pudding, trifle, and so much more. I hope you guys come and have a bite. See you in the UK. Look out for Rob Peters. Thank you, Rob. Hey, Noah, he said he's coming for you. What do you say to that? We'll see. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about uh, how much I would like the British food, but I would definitely have, mm, like to try some of it. And I would really love to visit the country. At some point, I would. Maybe not as the first country or the next country I visit, um, but at some point I will visit the United Kingdom. My recording is now two, one hour long and two gigabyte. Let's continue. 23 minutes in 47 minutes. So I have not even reached half of it and I 
about half of it and I am one hour long. Let's see. Well, that's all I got for you all today. I will catch you on the next one. Back to you, Barbs and Jay. Thank you. That was awesome. You did a great job. We just had a whole section about British food and you didn't mention crumpets. Oh. Gotta have a, I'll get you a crumpet. Hang on. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. This is a crumpet. Is that butter? Mm-hmm. Mm, I like butter. I approve. Uh, demographics. Demographics, okay. No. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Demographics. 66 million people, I guess. I think 66. And 67 is um, France. So after Germany, I think it's France. And then the United Kingdom. And then Italy. In European Union. In Europe, it's of course Russia. The most populated country. But in the European Union. Former European Union. I mean. It's Great Britain. United Kingdom is not any longer in the European Union. So technically if um, then we have also to consider other european countries like for example russia and then it is not um third but i mean then it's russia germany um united france then it's fourth and not third it's the most populated country in europe number four The question is, what does it mean to be British? Simply, beans on toast. A British person. A <laughs> what was this? What is a British person from the UK? Um, question mark. Question is, what does it mean to be British? Simply, beans on toast. Beans on toast. Well, I don't... I mean, I would eat toast maybe, but beans? I don't like beans, I think. A British person is um, a Greg sausage roll, knowing the difference between a cheeky Nando's and spoons. Welcome to Wales. Hey! We actually are a country. We have a language. It's the, the rugby, the communities, and the sites, as you can see. Brent you kailed in Enin Gumbra, never flew the Arian on the gag, on the card on the gallon, a chwev on the wine, Cumbrian beef. For me, a Scot. This was interesting, but of course, um, I mean, what means, of course, I have not understood anything. But it sounds nice. I like languages, so. Which <laughs> person is someone. I mean, I like different languages all around the world, and it sounds very nice what he said. Also, her accent is also nice. Or oh, what she's, I mean, her, her language sounds nice. Who has broad, thick accent that is barely recognizable. Iron Brew, the Proclaimers, Still Game, Haggis, this is our. We hell and Glen. For English I have heard that um, uh, the accent of London is very difficult to understand for foreigners. Maybe I will test this um, theory and listen to a video about this. There are probably videos about this, I guess. Let's see. This on a Saturday morning and irony. You should have a Sunday roast in a pub on Sunday. Someone of any background and um, everyone has a voice, everyone can say what they want. Bloody brilliant at queuing. We could be passively, aggressively polite. Someone who loves to complain about the weather. You complain about the weather, complain about the football, even when they win. My thing I think that relates all British people is the fact that uh, we created all these sports and yet we're so bad at all of them. Uniform. The benches for the year six, fifth and chip. Someone from the UK is very self-deprecating. We love to take the piss. Kind of like licorice all sorts. Everyone is mixed up with different things, but it's kind of like a big family that kind of argues with each other. So what is a person from the UK? Well, I mean, that question already in itself kind of has a little bit of a title dilemma in it. Sometimes it's hard to even give a demonym for the people living here. And for many of the people, and depending on the area, the title British might, un might not even be considered applicable. Yeah, Scottish and Welsh people will typically tell you that they are Scottish and Welsh first. People on the Isle of Man are Manx, and all those penguins in South Georgia are... <laughs> But for what it's worth, there's so much that goes into the concept of identity. When you break down the typical person that comes from the UK, it's not an easy question to answer. But what we can attempt to break down is the ethnic makeup of the country in the demographics graph. Henceforth, let's do it. For one, the UK has just over 68 million people. 68 million, so I was wrong. Maybe then is, um, Great Britain has more people than France, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I will have um, something um, on the screen right now uh, written down where I found out later and researched which country has now more people, France or Great Britain. But yeah, let's see. Maybe you see it right now. Maybe not. 
people and as of 2023 is speculated to now have the third largest population in Europe just surpassing France. When it comes to so he already answered my question. Interesting ethnic makeup, it's a little complicated to come by, but according to the most recent data from the Office of National Statistics, it is reported that the largest group are the white British peoples at somewhere around 87% of the country. This category is pretty broad, however. The office designates white into subgroups of white British, which includes Scottish and Welsh, Irish, Irish traveler, and whites of other nationalities. The remaining 13-ish percent are made up of other non-white ethnic backgrounds, the largest being Asian British peoples at somewhere around 7% of the country. The majority come from South Asian countries like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, about 3% are black British, mostly from Caribbean and West African backgrounds, and around 2% identify as ethnically mixed individuals, and around 1% identify with other groups. The UK- <laughs> um, I like the other group. I mean, I don't, I don't understand this ethnic, uh, ethnicity back, break, break, it's a thing that where he always, um, um, says this much of a percentage or is um, right, this much is Hispanic, or I don't understand why he do, uh, why he is doing this in general, but yeah, um, let's let's continue. It's just something personal. I don't understand this. Okay, uses the Type G plug outlet, and they drive on the left side of the road. And fun fact, it's because of the jousting thing, I believe. Sort of. So no one really knows why, but one theory is that when uh, medieval jousting happened, you used to hold the sword in your right hand, so it made sense to pass on the left. The majority of the UK uses the British pound sterling as its currency, sometimes called quid. That's right. Except in certain overseas territories, they may use other regional currencies. And that brings us to another quirky aspect of the UK: units of measurement. So the UK was, of course, the. This is this is very interesting. They invented the imperial system. I think, and then changed later um, to the metric system. Uh, but still, to in some ways, they use other units like stones and so, which I've heard, let's see what they will talk about now. They will explain it, I think. Birthplace of the famous imperial system. However, over the past few decades, the UK has been begrudgingly transitioning partially to metric. And the choice of units to use is absolutely insane. For example, speed, miles per hour, temperature, centigrade, for weight. If the subject is a person, you can use stone or pounds, but everything else, kilos and grams. For distance, if it's long distance, like on the road, we use miles. Unless if you're running, then it's kilometers. But if measuring a person, use feet and inches. Any other object, though, meters and centimeters. For volume, liters and milliliters. Unless it's beer or milk, when we use pints, but only cow's milk, not plant milk, in which case they use pints, but pints that are a little bigger than American pints. Yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. Although there's technically no official <laughs> It's very mixed up thing, I think. Um, it's very funny. <laughs> um, I cannot imagine anything else than just um, um, the metric system, which I'm used to. Um, for everything. But even in the United States, for example, it's a science use the metric system and the the industry is a uh, every everything else which is not science I think uses the imperial system mostly um to what I know if if I say something wrong please correct me and in the United Kingdom it seems um, very much mixed which is interesting and funny Language, the country's de facto national language is, of course, English, or Yay. technically modern English, which is incredibly different from old English. And during the 16th century, Shakespearean times, an early version of the modern style of English we know today started to evolve. Thank you, Shakespeare. And this, of course, brings us to the famous British versus American English scenario. The spelling subtleties are minor. Brits tend to spell words that are more similar to their Latin and Germanic origins, whereas Americans spell things more phonetically. Otherwise, uh, some words are just completely different, such as apartment, flat, fries, chips, chips, crisps, truck, lorry, gas, petrol, cookie, biscuit, can. Rubbish bin. I, I, I try to sound more British. I, I think, um, I, I mean, uh, <coughs> I want to sound more British because, um, it, well, in, in some ways, some some American words sound also better. It's, so it's a mixed up thing for me, I think. But I think rubbish sounds quite nice. But yeah, yard, garden, I mean, I know both words. So. <laughs> I cannot decide right now which one is better. Um, there are certain words I like in the one language, in one accent more, and then there are words I like in the different accent more. So sometimes I like the American word for for word more, and sometimes the English word, the British word. So.
Yard. Garden. Sidewalk. Pavement. Pavement. Road surface. Candy. Sweets. Faucet. Tap. Spigot. Tap. Flashlight. Torch. Oatmeal. Porridge. But I do- For example, for, for a flashlight, um, I know only flashlight for um, a Taschenlampe, it's in German. Um, but torch, I mean, yeah. I heard I heard that it's a, this word in, in British. Mm. But anyway, I like them both. I admit I like porridge better because it reminds me of fairy tales from childhood. I know, just try saying the word porridge and not being just a little bit more happy. Porridge, it's like the, the, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Porridge. Porridge. And don't even get me started on the accents. In fact, it's speculated that the UK has the largest variation of accents in a single language of any country in the world. Somewhere around 40 to 50, I believe. It is nuts. Like, if you think about just how small our islands are, and yet the accents have remained really resilient. The two cities of Liverpool and Manchester, only 30 miles apart, they sound completely different. Otherwise, the UK also has regionally recognized native Celtic-based minority languages. For example, Cornish is spoken in Cornwall by about four people, and Scottish Gaelic is spoken in Scotland, and by far the biggest of these surviving Celtic languages is Welsh. There are even Welsh TV channels and shows, radio stations, and almost all road signs are posted in Welsh and English in Wales. Each of these languages play a vital role to the cultures of their respective communities. Religion! Now this is- I would, I would, um, religious, religion, I think the king is also the head of church, um, but about the Wales, I would like to maybe even learn some Welsh. Celtic, or a Welsh and Celtic and other languages. Sometimes I just learn languages for fun. It's just some small languages like Lithuanian. I learned a bit um, after the Lithuanian episode, but I don't need to learn English after the um, uh, this episode because I know already how to speak English. Mm. I learned a bit Swedish um, after Sweden and um, Polish after Poland. So yeah, just on Duolingo a bit. It's, it's fun. I like it. Anyway, let's continue. An interesting one because for most of the UK's history, there's always been kind of like a complication when it came to religious affairs and leadership. After the Church of England renounced papal authority from the Catholic Church in 1534, things got tricky. It was kind of like, Oh heavens, our dear monarch hath doth doneth died. Who shalt beeth next in line? If. It's insert name of next to kin. But here's the problem. The Catholic. Jolly toddly wonkles, no. Let's burn things! That seemed to solve problems! Burn! And that's like how 28% of their domestic wars started. In any case, the country is technically a Christian country. Actually, it's technically a theocracy where the crown gets its power from God. Long story. And a majority of them hold religion to more of a traditional role, mostly reserved for national festivals, traditions, and even schools and politics. With all that said and done, it's very important to also highlight the immigrant and non-European communities that make up a very notable demographic of the UK as well. The black community dates back to the 17th century, when attendants and servants were brought over, such as John Blank during the Tudor dynasty, who was paid about 16 pence a day for his trumpeting skills. Most the enslaved black people were brought to the Caribbean, not Great Britain. So the black British community stayed relatively small and was mostly confined to Liverpool. It wasn't until the mid-20th century when communities from the Caribbean and West Africa started to set up communities over here. The UK also has the oldest Chinese community in Europe arriving in the 19th century, followed by other Asian groups like Indians and Arabs. Basically, no matter who you are or what you are, everyone born and raised in the UK will- Um, yeah, until 1999 or 1998, I'm not sure, um, um they had also Hong Kong and that they are jurisdiction and I think now it's for 50 years something independent and in 50 years or 2048, 2045 or so it will completely be a part of China and I'm not mistaken there's a um, period um, of 50 years um, I also think from Macau um, one, one, was really, one of the both was um, 1999 uh, um, stopped being a colony or an overseas protectorate and the other was um, 1999 or 1998. I'm not sure which one was when. Mm, I think maybe Macau was later, but I'm not sure. Um, maybe I have the correct one on screen right now. Let's see. But yeah, let's continue. Um, we'll have a common understanding of a certain set of values and customs unique to the UK. For one, the schooling system. Oh, this is a weird one. Yeah, <laughs> so you might have got hints of what it's like from the Harry Potter films and books. Uniforms are worn not only to show school identity, but also to foster a sense of unity and equality. And you can't make fun of the kids that wear bad clothes because it's like they're all wearing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, nobody can, well, you can still bully people. I, I see the reason for uniforms in schools. I would still not um, like to have them. I mean, I'm happy I never had to wear uniforms. It reminds me also a bit too much to military, but I see the advantages. I see the advantages um, to wear school uniforms. Um, against discrimination and so on. So that's a great thing. 
Both also, are. like, <laughs> which is not on clothes. Education is. It's also not uncommon in the world. I think many countries do this. Um, also in Russia and in China, I think also in India, maybe. Uh, but I'm not sure. But um, I think in Russia, I'm not sure. But there are many countries who do this. And I see the advantages. The huge part of our culture English, maths, that's right, maths, not maths. You say maths. You say maths. Not mathematics. And science and even physical education are compulsory subjects for every stage until the GCSE exams, and compulsory education ends at age 18. Yeah, and you have that college is another thing you guys have, but it's like you're. Well, right, yeah. so the word college yeah. is for older children, it's for teenagers who've chosen to study something very specific. Yes, yeah. That's Whereas true. in America, it's just you call college what we call university. It's, it's where we get wasted because we're saying we're studying, but we're not. Another unique trait of the UK's social atmosphere is the fact that since it is a constitutional monarchy, much of the country has a deep tie to the traditions related to said monarchy. The inner core of the royal family today has about 50 or so members that are either descended or married into the House of Windsor. Only about half of them actually carry out royal duties, which usually include diplomatic missions and being the face of the UK. Whatever you want to make of that. Outside of the royal family, of course, many noblemen were appointed leadership roles over certain areas, and today you can still even find many people that are descended from these lesser ranked individuals that had ties to the monarch. Well, you can, but you have to go to the very posh public schools, which, by the way, is what we call what you call private schools. Right. Uh, you're likely to run into people who say, oh, I'm actually 718 to 9 to the throne because my uh, third father once removed was the 13th Duke and Duchess of Wyndham. Sometimes you'll find heirs to the throne where you least expect it. For example, did you know that Olympian Zara Phillips is the Queen's granddaughter? No, I did not know that. But we can learn more about the sports... Sport. ...of the UK with art, with the sports part. Sport part. The sport part. <laughs> I like this correction. <laughs> it's funny. All right, guys, I'm back. Let's get athletic. And the UK is quite the contender. They have nearly a thousand medals in the Olympics, and nearly 300 of which are gold. The UK is the father of many types of sports rugby, cricket, yes, even soccer or football. And hey, for all you Brits that are criticizing us Americans for calling it soccer, we got the word from you. You and. Maybe. I mean, uh, I heard about this before that um, um, it's like the imperialism. They invented it, they gave it to the Americans, then they changed the system, and later they make fun about them. <laughs> I mean, we all like to make fun about each other at some point. So, um, Americans make fun about Germans, Germans make fun about um, France, France about um, Great Britain, and the other way around as well. Pro 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 probably. You make fun about me, which is fine. So, it's all just fun and um, nice. Sometimes it's harsh critic, of course, but also often it's fun. Invented it. It came from the word association football. So, it's kind of your fault. Although the concept of playing a game where you kick a ball around has been around since the ancient times, the modern version of what we call football was started in the UK in the 19th century using inflated pig bladders. I wonder how they got started with that. They're just like, they're eating some bacon and then they're, they're like, oh, that looks kind of inflatable, you know? <laughs> like, so far, England has won one World Cup in 1966 against West Germany, and it was in the iconic old Wembley Stadium that has since been torn down due to infrastructure problems and it was buried under a huge grass mound. Also, the trophy was stolen but found by Pickles the dog. True story. Either way, football is such a huge part of the UK's identity and they could talk about it forever. They even have a subculture of hooligans or the obnoxious football fans that like always get drunk and start fights and beat each other up. It's almost like a whole other sport itself and it's equally entertaining to watch. Like <laughs> And some fo football fans can be quite um, annoying. Sometimes. But um, there are also many people who just enjoy football and yeah. But let them do their fun if they um, do it um, just in their group and not um, affecting others. They, in my opinion, they can, also, they can also beat each other up if they do it um, somewhere where no innocent people get harmed drunken MMA, right? Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, the modern form of rugby or rugby union was invented in the town of Rugby where it got its name from. However, many will say rugby is actually descended from the Welsh game Canapin, which is why today some of the best rugby players come from Wales and it is a huge part of their national identity. Cricket was invented in South England in the 1500s and is one of the most long-winded sports that can last days to finish. Scotland is also a hub of invention. I've heard about cricket as well. 
even at some point watched a video explaining me how cricket works and um i forgot already i think <laughs> but it's a very important sport for um the united kingdom and also for example for india and other former british colonies i heard i heard it only from india but maybe it's also a popular sport in south africa so i'm not sure mm, but it's interesting sports. The modern version of golf was also started in Scotland in the 16th century and water polo in the 19th century. Scotland is also most noted for their Highland Games, where a bunch of people in kilts compete in a series of strength-based events like the caber toss, Scottish hammer throw, and the weight over bar toss. Oh, by the way, I did a DNA test, came back 48% Scottish. Thought you were Polish. Yeah, so a lot less Polish than what I thought. What? I mean, it makes sense, though. So take me in. It makes sense, the gingery. The ginge. I'm Scottish. <laughs> I should have known. In Northern Ireland, it's not uncommon to see Gaelic football and hurling being played native to the island. The UK is also known for their weird and wacky sports and competitions people loving taking part in, such as the Cooper Hill cheese rolling race thing. Yeah, I've heard of this. It's, it's a um, um, run... Um... After this, she said, it, it's very funny. <laughs> Tar barrel racing, toe wrestling, shin kicking. Let's do that one. We'll, we'll do it after this. <laughs> Pancake racing, the stinging nettle eating contest. Yeah, I used to get stung by those things all the time when I was a kid. Like, I cannot imagine eating those things. Gravy wrestling. These are weird. They even have a gurning contest, which is where, like, in order to win, you have to make, like, the ugliest face possible. Like this. In any case, that's all I got for you. Cheers. Is this with the ugly face competition I've also heard? Um, it, it's always funny. I, I like it. It's it's um, it's weird and it's funny. Like the um, infinite the wife carrying competition. I I've heard of this in the infinite episode, obviously. Let's continue. Cheerio, toodle pop, jolly good, crumbly wrinkles, old chap and. And whatever, I'm gonna get the. <laughs> this ginger is gonna skedaddle out of here. Toodaloo. Thank you, Art. Jay, what are some just of the biggest, most notable traditions you've experienced living here? The day after Christmas, we call it Boxing Day, the 26th of December. It's an extension of the holiday, okay. so you get yet another day off work, and there's also a lot of football going on and lots of great stuff on the telly. I thought that was a day where you boxed each other because you're fighting over cheap prices at the grocery store. Right? Actually, fun fact, the reason it's called Boxing Day is... Barb's was kind of right. Originally, it was supposed to be about giving gifts to the poor, but now it's about getting half-off deals at the mall. Yeah, Boxing Day. Okay, well, good way to transition into the culture of the UK, and with that, let's bring it to to our homegirl Hannah with the culture segment. Hey guys, I'm back. Well, actually, now we're back. Oh! You don't get it. Yeah, I, I get it. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm, I'm pregnant. Hannah did a thing. And Ian, he was there too. Okay, this is gonna be a heavy one because. <laughs> yeah, they, they both did a thing. Because with the UK, it's almost like you're getting an economy-sized multi-package deal of culture and tradition. For one, you must distinguish between whether someone is from England, Scotland. I mean, many of the flags, especially the blue one, were just uh, um, um, the Union Jacks. I think it's the Union Jacks is in the upper left corner. They look, of course, very similar. The other ones look much more interesting. I, um, also, those which are not blue. On Wales, Northern Ireland, the O. So, I mean, except from the um, flags, where there's no Union Jacks um, inside of it, um, it's the top left one I think looks the best with this raving things. It, it looks nice. Overseas territories or crown dependencies. To break it down a little easier, you have the Celtic areas and then you have the Anglo Saxon side. So let's start with a quick overview of Scotland. Cultural rule number one do not attempt the accent. Even if you think you're good at it, just don't. You're not good at it. <laughs> that was so bad. <laughs> Historically, Scotland was divided by clans, each with their own territory. Each clan even had their own plaid tartan design. And Scottish last names often have a map before it. Some very notable cultural aspects you will probably encounter at some point include Kaylee dances. Yeah, Professor McGonagall in Harry Potter, for example. 
Bagpipes. January 25th is a huge deal where they celebrate Burns Night. New Year's Eve is called Hogmanay. Fireball swinging. And the first person to enter the household is considered the bringer of good luck. And the iconic New Year's song, Old Lang Syne. You know that song. Da na 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 yeah, I'm also not um, raised in an English-speaking country. Maybe it's different in the United States. I've never heard of it here in Germany. Sign. Who knew that's what they were saying? I was just making words up. <laughs> also, everyone in Scotland will tell you to try a deep-fried Mars bar, as now Wales. Wales is a unique and very underrated place. It is the land of song, poetry, but at the same time, hardcore rugby, shin-kicking dragons, and powerful castles. In Wales, the daffodil is a symbol used for women and the leek used for men. Typical emblems of the daffodil or leek are worn on St. David's Day, where people clean their rooms and are nice to one another. Are they not nice other days? <laughs> <laughs> so you get well. one day a year to be nice. And speaking of which, love spoons. In Wales, traditionally, um. They look nice. Typically, they had uh, secret symbols carved in them. Love spoons, okay. I will take a deeper look into this. They, they look nice, I like this. Man would carve a spoon and give it to the woman he loved. They have the Mari Lloyd celebration, where they put a horse's skull on a pole. The Don's gum ride. The Estid Fod is a huge deal. Every Welsh person will bring up Tom Jones. Oh, uh, do you want to be loved by anyone? Moving on to Northern Ireland. This is a complicated one because it's kind of like if the UK and Ireland had a confusing baby that had an identity crisis. Avoiding all the complicated politics that go into this one. This area obviously has a more Irish Celtic influence and has a mix of Protestant Catholic people. This is the only place that allows people to freely choose to have either one or both citizenship of either the UK or Ireland. Keep in mind, this is not the official flag of Northern Ireland. Just watch the show Dairy Girls. It does a great job at covering the general idea of what Northern Ireland was like, especially at the end of the conflict era. England! It is in itself super complicated and cool culturally diverse. It is home to the monarchy, which is a vital aspect of their identity. Keep in mind, although certain individuals can be knighted for their accomplishments, it is only a recognition, not an inclusion into royalty. Generally speaking, English regional cultures are mostly Anglo-Saxon based and concentrated in six areas. Speaking of which, England has the widest range of classical architecture. You can find people living in Tudor-style half-timber thatched roofed homes next to Victorian, next to Georgia, next to Art Deco all in the same block. Also, the UK loves to give regional nicknames to people. Liverpool people, Scouse, Birmingham are Broomies, Manchester is Mank, Newcastle is Geordie, Sunderland is Mackin, Devon and Plymouth folk are Janners, East Londoners are Cockney, and they speak in a weird codified language. Much of what might be considered English culture was spurred off by the English Renaissance. The era created some of the most renowned authors and playwrights, most notable, the man himself, William Shakespeare. As a nation, the UK was the home of many inventions and discoveries. Way too many people to mention. We'll just pop up a list here. Cinema has always been a huge part of UK culture and has been contributing to the world since 1888, when the first motion picture in the world was shot in Leeds by Louis Le Prince. Hey, Louis Le Prince was not British, he was French. I know, I'm just saying he made his motion picture in the UK. To continue in Anywho, the fact that the American version of The Office was inspired by the UK version of The Office, and that is. Um, the, I look forward for the um, friend zone part where they will also probably talk about France as um, a big rivalry throughout history. And I have not watched either of those movies or whatever this is. Um, but yeah, I look forward for the friend zone. It's pretty fun. One of our most like well-renowned television shows is amazing. I mean, it's one it's one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Honestly, I think we did better though. Come on, Kevin I, Malone, best character. Kevin Malone. Dude. Our version of Dwight is way better than y'all's. I'm so sorry. That he is true. really is. In any case, the territories and crown dependencies all have their own unique traits as well. Jersey and Guernsey and the Isle of Man each have their own languages and confusing political systems. In Gibraltar, people speak Yanito. The Pitcairn Islands has a 
Polynesian Creole called Pit Kern. Turks and Caicos has a Caribbean House Evolution boat party, and the Cayman Islands have an entire week dedicated to pirates. Well, that was a lot, and we didn't even cover a small fraction of everything that could be discussed with the UK culture. And of course, one huge facet of UK culture is their music. And with that, Keith is on tour. Can't leave his dream job to be here. Ugh. So let's give this segment to a British musician. Guys, say hi to David. And we got David here. Uh, explain who you are. Introduce yourself. I'm a music nerd from the UK and I have a channel called David Bennett Piano. Britain has always had a rich musical culture. We had the Elizabethan lute music of John Dowland, the grand Baroque music of Handel, and at the start of the 20th century, we had two of Britain's most influential composers, Gustav Holst and Edward Elgar. Elgar? I've heard um, music from Elgar already. Um, classical music. It is very um, beautiful. I like it very much. But it wasn't really until the 1960s that British music became the global cultural export that it is today. Of course, I'm talking about the British invasion, where bands such as the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Animals, and of course, the Beatles took the world by storm. And then since that invasion, the UK has continued to contribute to global popular music. Many genres of music can trace their origins back to the UK. Heavy metal, for example, was pioneered in the early 70s by the likes of Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and Deep Purple. And many of prog rock's most iconic bands hail from the UK, including Pink Floyd, Yes, and Genesis. Highly successful artists have hailed from every corner of the UK. The most famous Welsh musician is probably Sir Tom Jones. Northern Ireland has Van Morrison and Scotland's most successful musician. I have not heard of them. Most of them be the Beatles, of course I heard of them. Um, but I think that's pretty much everything. <laughs> one and a half hour by the way. I mean, I think the total reaction will be around one and a half hour. Is probably Calvin Harris. Britain has always had a strong history of folk music as well, particularly in Scotland where Gaelic language music is still very popular with artists like Judy Fowlis continuing the tradition today. Queen, David Bowie, George Michael, Kate Bush, Oasis, Elton John, Radiohead, Muse, Coldplay, The Spice Girls, Ed Sheeran, Adele, ever since that British invasion in the 1960s, the UK has not stopped churning out culture-defining music and I'm sure it will play a major part in popular music for decades to come. Thank you, David. Actually, uh, guys, if you didn't know, uh, Jay is a musician. You make music as well. Um, sometimes. What are some of your biggest uh, inspirations in music? Is it really, really boring and dull and uninteresting if I say that my favorite band is the Beatles? Yeah, it kind of does. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Basic! <laughs> well, uh, we covered so much in this segment. Jay, what's, uh, what else can we talk about in this episode? Shall we do the friend zone? So I'm very curious. I know that they have, they have diplomatic relations with many countries. For example, as well, North Korea. So, um, yeah, let's see. So obviously, the UK has a lot of diversity, and of course, it's due to their history. As you can see, Britain has had a fair few dealings with other countries around the world, which brings us to... The animation, the, the, the motion graphic. First of all, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and founding member of numerous IGOs, such as the G7, NATO, World Trade Organization, and Council of Europe, the UK has lots of international ties. Although the Brexit situation did cut them off from EU authority, many of the diplomatic laws and trade deals with the EU are almost exactly the same as they were pre-Brexit, and today the interaction is still there and open. It's just a little different when it comes to certain legislative issues like immigration and economic policy. This is a topic for another time. In any case, the UK has spent the last hundred years coming to terms with the fact that they were pretty much seen as the antagonist in so many independent stories across the world. Even though the empire has gone, its influence is still strongly felt around the world, with lots of other countries speaking English, playing cricket, having similar-ish systems of government, and so on. Many of these countries are members of the Commonwealth of Nations, and the monarch is still, at least in a figurehead sense, the head of... This is interesting. Three nations uh, that were never part of the former British Empire have also joined. Um, Rwanda, Gabon, and Mozambique. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> state of many of them. The UK still has very close relations to the Commonwealth countries, with many of these people settling in the UK, most notably some of the largest diaspora communities from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Ghana, and the Caribbean. The UK, or England in particular, had a massive rivalry with France riddled with war for much of their history. For the last century though, especially after World War II, they've done a complete 180 and have found themselves on the same team in almost all global conflicts, and each side loves to poke fun, but in a loving way, at each other. Interestingly enough, the country they probably 
have the most in common with, Ireland, has had quite a few scuffles and conflict, especially before the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. Today, however, you can't deny that the citizens of both countries enjoy an extremely close relationship. Many British people have Irish heritage, they intermarry quite a bit, and many have dual citizenship. Australia and Spain have the largest communities of British national residents living abroad. Australia has always been a hotbed destination for immigration for Brits seeking the warmer climate, and specifically for Spain, Ibiza is almost like a little Britain, as so many British people either go there on holiday or to move. In terms of their best friends, however, many in the UK would probably say that I, I guess so. I mean, um, uh, as I already told it, it might be the United States, which is, I think, a bit sad. Mm, understandable, but yeah, let's see. The USA and maybe some might include Canada. The biggest differences between the two is that the USA gained full independence through revolution, whereas Canada just kind of stayed British until they slowly over time requested to be given more and more autonomy until technically 1982 when they adopted their own constitution, but still remained under the Commonwealth. It wasn't even long after the Revolutionary War that the UK and USA quickly patched things up, having a shared language and today a population with about 11% of its people ethnically descended from British roots has not only further helped them communicate and relate culturally, but eventually they've joined in almost all major international conflicts since the mid-19th century. Today they swap each other's films, TV shows. Is um, there something funny? I mean, first the um, United Kingdom colonized the United States with the certain colonies, and now um, the United Kingdom is, um, you know, very close ally to the United States. I think it's funny shows, music, and so on. And in Europe, anything USA related will typically have some kind of connection to the UK as they kind of act as like the link between North America and Europe. Overall, the USA and UK may have started sour, but today they have never been closer. All right, and with that, in conclusion, uh, Jay, you are the Brit. I'm going to give this to you. In conclusion, sorry about the empire, but basically Britain is now finding its role as a modern progressive country that hopes to leave a good mark on the world. This flag actually makes me realize that when Brits go abroad, even though we like to claim that we're not very patriotic you know we go abroad and it turns out yes we really are and we really care and we really do love our country and they hate when people fly their flag upside down <laughs> it isn't also backwards everything's wrong well uh jay i think there was nobody better than you to be in this episode and to oh, co-host with you. me uh guys i guess uh, that means stay tuned the <laughs> <laughs> sorry um United States is coming up next, and I look so much forward to this country. I mean, I say always, I mean it always, <clears throat> that I probably, probably never will visit the United States due to some issues like police violence and um, other things. Um, I mean, some things um, like um, um, policies I don't like also, which wouldn't influence me as a tourist, but police violence and this kind of things would influence me potentially um, as a tourist, so that's why I would probably not visit the United States. Maybe things change, maybe I change, maybe um, I, I take this risk at some point, but in the moment I cannot imagine to visit the United States. Um, but yeah, I look forward to this episode and I will also make a reaction to it and yeah, I, I let him finish it first. Home country, USA. Is coming up next. Good luck. Yes, I um, look very much forward to um, the episode for about the United States in this year, in two months, in two and a half months, in three months or so, I don't know, something like this, maybe just um, one and a half months even. I look forward. Geography you now, the United States, his home country. Yes, I hope you enjoyed this video, um, especially if you come from the United Kingdom or one of the overseas territories. Um, as as European, we are all European. 
I mean, you know, to British people. Real friends. I am, I consider myself to be a friend of the United Kingdom. I look forward to visit your country one day. I like many of the things he mentioned in the video. I of course have also something to criticize the United, the United Kingdom or the government for, but I have this kind of things for every country. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. And um, subscribe for the links. Meow. 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 And if you can, if you really watch through my entire reaction, one hour and 40 minutes, congratulations. <laughs> watch some other videos from me if you like. Uh, I have done some reactions to different countries and um, also other videos about other reactions to other YouTubers or other topics. I'm currently playing um, Minecraft. Um, so if you want to see me play Minecraft, if you have some other games you want me to play, um, to write it down in the comments, suggest me videos if you want to see a certain topic, follow me on Twitch if you want to see me live eventually at some point. Um, I already made, made some streams, I will do it again maybe. Yeah. I mean, you know it is um, today is uh, um, 30 months of um, May, because um, I told you 6-7 hours ago, he up um he published this video and you can also find out when he will find out the video. So normally I don't say when when I record something because I think it's not important. But uh, for this occasion I think it yeah it doesn't matter. Yeah. You will see this video probably in a few days next weekend. So yeah I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>